On today's photo moment, we're going to talk about the brand new Panasonic Leica 50 to 200 millimeter lens. I'm going to show you some pictures of it and tell you what I think. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at YouTube, youtube.com slash Photo Joseph every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Ryan wants me to try it again. I say, let's just roll with it. Uh, how you guys doing? I hope you're having a good week, had a good weekend. It's Monday. We're ready to uh, rock and roll for the rest of the week. And I am rocking and rolling with this lens, the 50 to 200. I did an unboxing on this a little while ago. If you want to see everything that comes in the box, click here. We'll show you that. Um, but the, the lens, what you really want to know is how this lens works what I thought of it and, um, and what kind of pictures it can make. So when I first did the unboxing, I said, hey, what am I gonna do with it? I need something new to do with this lens. I don't usually shoot with long lenses. It's just not part of my normal repertoire. Uh, when I tested the 100 to 400, when I tested the 200 to 8, I needed to find things to do. And I shot some, what I shot a uh, college women's basketball game. I've shot the, we don't, we don't have a zoo. We have a um, wild animal park, wildlife safari it's called. It's kind of closest to here. I've been out there a few times. I needed something different. And there were some great suggestions that came in, but then I had completely forgotten that I already had a trip planned to Detroit for a Panasonic event to work at the Detroit Zoo. And so I thought, well, obviously, I'm going to take the lens with me and shoot there. And so I did. And it was awesome. Uh, so that's what I got. So we got animal pictures again. I hope that's okay with you. We're going to look at some animal pictures shot at the Detroit Zoo. If you're following me on Instagram, at Photo Joseph, if you're not, please do. If you're following me on Instagram, you might have seen some of these photos already. I posted a few while I was down there, and I posted a couple in the last couple of days leading up to this show. But overall, I gotta say, I am, I am impressed. I like this lens a lot more than I expected to. And I say that because I don't normally shoot with long lenses. Like this just is not a focal length that I normally need. Now, I do want to say in full disclosure for anybody who's not seen the show before, I am a Panasonic Lumix ambassador. So I am naturally biased towards this. So, uh, you know, just deal with that. That's just the way it is. Uh, I but I am really, I'm really excited about this lens. It's actually really, really cool. So I, I had the 100 to 400, and I've had the 200 to 8. Neither one of those are things that I've kept. Those are were just on loan. Um, I, I think I get to keep. This. I actually don't even know if I get to keep this one. Tom, do I get to keep this one? I have no idea. But this lens, when combined with the 8 to 18 and the 12 to 60, makes for quite the trifecta. Like I hadn't really realized that until I think someone even said something on social media, and I was going, oh yeah. You're right, so eight to 18, a little bit of overlap going back to 12, up to 60, a little bit of overlap going down to 50, up to 200. So on full frame sizes, that would be a 16 up to 400 millimeter range. That's a pretty good range to have into three lenses. Now, obviously these are not fixed aperture lenses, so they are not the fastest glass that money can buy, but by having a slight variable aperture, you do get a smaller, physically smaller and lighter weight lens. Let's take the shade off of there so it's a little bit more, like that's the actual size of it. Um, and it's overall, even though it's, okay, this is a 2.8 to f4, at the f4 range, because you're at 200 millimeter or 400 equivalent 35, you're getting really good shallow depth of field. And that is still quite good low light gathering capability. You'll see as we look at some of the photos, shooting in the zoo, shooting in, in the shade, in lower light situations, it wasn't a, um, the first day was overcast the whole day, which is great, nice flat lighting, no hard shadows, but also lower light. You'll see that the camera bumped up the ISO quite a bit sometimes. I'm shooting usually in aperture priority, so it's opting for a pretty high shutter speed because it, it knows long lens, it wants to do a high shutter speed. And yeah, we got into some pretty high ISO photos in here, but I think they all look pretty great. So that's what we're going to, uh, we're gonna take a look at. Now, I did get some questions on comments or on the socials asking how it compared to the 100 to 400, because that's, that's a big question, right? The 100 to 400 is about the same price. I think it's actually ever so slightly cheaper. It is a slower lens, but obviously a much longer reach. Given, given that I don't usually need a long lens, that 100 to 400 was like a really long reach. That is way more than I need for my normal daily stuff. So in that regard, the 50 to 200 is much more practical. This is a lens that I, if I had both of them side by side, the 50 to 200 is one I'm going to get a lot more use out of. Image quality, I'd have to do a comparison side by side. I mean, they're both like lenses. I'm sure they're both equally sharp and great. But I have heard a lot of people very, very happy with this lens. And having used it now for a little bit, I got to say that I am, I'm stoked with it. And you're going to see in a moment here some really good sharp lenses, uh, really good sharp photos out of this. So 2.8 at the um, at the zoomed out range, 
F4 at the zoomed in range of 200, so 400 mil equivalent. It's got the optical image stabilization built into it, so you, you really take advantage of that. It's amazing to be holding a lens that long. And when I did the unboxing, I did a little you know, switch on the, the OIS and see it lock things into place. It is remarkable that you can handhold a lens that long and have just no movement. It's kind of crazy. But, uh, but yeah, overall, really, really beautiful lens. Let's take a quick look at the B&H page. I want to make sure you guys know what we're getting into here. Here it is. So this thing is on B&H right now. It is just under 1700. So this is the Panasonic Leica DG Vario Elmer at 50-200 f2.8 to 4.0 aspherical power optical image stabilization lens. I mean, could the name be any longer? It's a big name. Big name, big lens. Yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, it's great. Really cool. Let's uh, let's take a look at some pictures because that's what really that's where the proof in the pudding, as they say. So I'm going to load up a couple things here. We're looking at my um, uh, Lightroom library. This is Lightroom CC. I was uh, I out in the field. I just took I just took my iPad with me to Detroit. So hotel, just pop in the card into here into the into the SD card reader, load everything in, and uh, we're, I just think we're going to look at some of the three star ones that I've marked on here. Let's go full screen on these. And, uh, and then on the next day, we'll look at more pictures. You'll see some of the less great ones as well, so you can kind of see the progression of them. But uh, anyway, just swipe through some. So, you know, chimpanzee, monkey, monkey see, monkey do. I mean, if you guys want, well, I can't say yell in my ear and tell me to stop. That'll that really work. But if you see a picture that you really want to know more about, put something in the comments, put out photo Joseph on it. I'm, of course, watching the comments here. I will uh, scroll back and I'll jump into those. And we might save those for the Q&A afterwards, getting into the nitty gritty if you want to see it. But if you want to know any information about a specific photo, do let me know. We will do our best to, uh, oops, wrong one, do our best to, uh, to get that up. Anyway, so, look, you cute little, okay, this actually, this is a cool one because, okay, this is a tiny little, it's like, this big, this little creature, and he's just sitting there in the corner, going, walking by. What the heck's making this noise? See this little guy up on the fence? Go in there. This is probably at 200. Let's actually let's do this. Let's go into the full info on here. Um, it is, yep, it's a 200 millimeter. We can see that kind of in this space right here, and 500th of a second at ISO 6400. So this is, you know, relatively high ISO, right? And you can see the quite shallow depth of field on that. I mean, look, we got nice sharp on the eyes there and uh, falling off to the background there pretty good. You can see as I move this around, uh, the way Lightroom Mobile or Lightroom CC works, you'll see some of the color noise in there. And as soon as I stop, it resolves, it removes that color noise. So Lightroom's doing a great job of doing a little bit of cleanup on this image. And overall, it looks pretty darn good, right? So that's obviously handheld. 200 millimeter, I'm pretty close to the subject because he is such a tiny little creature. Yeah, not too, not too shabby, right? Not too shabby. Uh, this was fantastic. What an experience. So early, early in the morning, well, early, I mean, 8 a.m., uh, there's, the zoo's not officially open yet, and so I'm walking around getting some, scouting out the area, and there's these two polar bears. And they're, now how polar bears can hang out in the Detroit Zoo where it was like 90 degrees the rest of the day, I don't quite understand. But anyway, these polar bears were playing in the water. I'm sure it was nice cold water. And check this out, just so beautiful to get a chance to see, to see this and to photograph this. And these bears are playing with each other and having a good old wrestling time, splashing water around. And you can see the really high shutter speed on there. We're freezing the water motion. What are we at? Um, 500th of a second. So again, aperture priority, I'm sure that's what I'm usually at. This is now ISO 200. So there's a lot more light here than there was taking a picture of the little squishy rodent thing. And um, let's see what we just, there we go. Some nice big action shots. I'm just freezing that water midair there as it's flying around. I just, that was so cool. I was stoked. I was really excited to, that we got to see this. And the bears just went to sleep after this and hid for the rest of the day. So most of the guests did not get to see this. Um, peacock, so they really great bokeh, right? Great bokeh on that. What are we looking at here? This is um, 400th of a second of F4, ISO 1250. So you know, pretty high on the ISO then. Again, there, a little bit less light there than, uh, than we had with the, um, the bears. I mean, I think it's really nice separation. And you know, beautiful, beautiful tiger in there. She's hiding out in the shade. She's in the shade, staying out of the sun. So that's quite dark. Let's see what the ISO is on this one. That's only 2000, that's not that bad. Um, and, then, and then there's the butterfly. So clearly not a macro lens, but because of the long reach, and it does have a fairly close focus, closest focusing distance, you can get some really macro-like photos with this, which really surprised me. That, that was really nice to see. So shooting butterflies, there's this whole butterfly room in the, uh, at the Detroit Zoo. Beautiful, there's all kinds of flowers in there, and they've got, you know, I don't know, whatever, dozens of species of butterflies in there, and they're all flipping around. And they tend to hang out for quite a long time in one place, and then when they decide to take off, it's just like that, that they're gone. And so I thought I was gonna try and be clever and find one that had landed, 
focus on it, hold, and I was trying to get a little bit of motion blur with the wings, and so I was doing shutter priority, going a little bit slower on the shutter, playing with various shutter speeds, waiting for that butterfly to move, and then press the shutter down and shoot the 20 frames per second or whatever it is this camera G9 ridiculously does, and try and get something cool. I got a couple of decent ones. Um, those They lay down, and then they're like there for the day. There were butterflies that I swear I stalked one out for like 20 minutes before I gave up. And of course, you turn around to say something, you're back, and the thing is gone. It knows they're watching you. Anyway. But yeah, almost macro-like. That's beautiful. Look at that. That's just so pretty. Isn't that pretty? That's nice. I think it's really nice. Uh, oh, there's another one. I wonder, was it in this set? I think so. Where I got really close. So there's trying to get the motion of the thing flying away. Yay! Kind of got it. Not really. Um, I did a really close-up one. It's a chap trying out, so this is GH4, his GH4, trying out the new 8-18 lens. That was part of the thing of the day, by the way, if you were uh, not there for the zoo day. Panasonic was there with Woodward Camera, camera store out in the area. So was Canon. No, Canon wasn't there. Nikon was there. Sony was there. Um, Sigma was there. Loaning out gear. And so you could try out whatever gear you wanted. It's great. It's, if you get a chance to do one of these events, it's a great way to get your hands on some gear. Um, but this, that's not the photo that I was hoping to show you a photo. Let's see, I must have not rated it for some reason. Let me just turn the ratings down on here. Where it was very much macro-like going, here we go, it's one of these guys, where I went in super close, look at that, getting that, uh, trying to get the eye in focus, a little too close there. Hard to do, handheld. The eye, it turns out, is it's got like a, it's not a sharp pattern, so it's really hard to know if I was actually focused on the eye or not. Ended up focusing on the that thing, and uh, you can see it's. I mean, that's the proboscis. Oh, Ryan, getting all techy in my ear. Proboscis, he says. Sounds about something I learned in in high school at some point. Um, anyway, cool, right? I think pretty good. I, again, really nice shallow depth of field looking in there. Really worked out quite nice. This is funny. The lady that works there, she kind of wears a crown of butterfly. It's like the butterflies know her and they just hang out on her head the whole time. Pretty funny trying to get a shot of that. There we go. Kind of cute. Uh, anyway, so yes, that's good. So let's, uh, we're going to take a look at the second day on there. Before we do that, let me take a quick look at the comments of people talking about the, oh, the chipmunk. Yeah, the little squishy animal thing. It's a chipmunk. Squishy rodent thing. That's my technical name for it. Um, yeah, we're going to look at some other pictures in there. I did want to, before I do that, let me remind you of this, because this is really important. India. We're going to India, guys. You going to come? Who wants to go to India? We're doing a photography workshop in India next year, the end of January into February, January to February 2019. If you go to photojoseph.com slash India, that will take you to the page where it talks all about it. We have a ton of information on the website at that URL, of course talking about the trip. There is a, a full itinerary of what we're doing in there. We had an interview with two of my friends who came on the show who've recently been to India, talking about their experiences there, showing off their photos. You too will be able to create images like that if you come with me to India. So do check that out, photojoseph.com slash India. It's gonna be awesome. And incidentally, if you haven't been to photojoseph.com yet, it's all new, so go check that out, please do. Okay, um, let's go into the second day, which I have not fully rated. So we're gonna look at some more photos in here kind of do a little bit more swiping through. And this is intentional so that you can see a little bit more of the progression. So we're not just looking at the best shots in here, we see a little bit more in the progression on it. So let's uh, let's see here, let's go for, the polar bears weren't doing anything at all. They're like bored, uh, but this is cool. The brown bears or, um, not brown bears, what are these guys? Uh, grizzlies. These guys finally got to start playing in the water and this is fun. Some of these are really, really rapid fire uh, high FPS shots, but this is what the G9 does, super high frame per second, shooting full resolution raw with continuous autofocus, pretty remarkable. Obviously, these bears weren't exactly moving around that much, so we don't have to worry about the focus too much on here, but you can see them playing, there, play, playing, look, there we go, playing together there, pretty cool, pretty awesome, like kissing each other and just ooh, having fun. That's what they're doing, they're having fun. Bears do, bears have fun, there you go. Um, it's not always responsive, is it? There it goes. So that was kind of cool. Wow, like lots and lots of pictures. Okay, you really don't want to look at that many pictures of the bears. But look, I mean, all, look, there was one shot that was slightly out of focus. Out of all those so far, which have all been perfectly, perfectly sharp, there's one that was slightly out of focus. And, you know, who knows why that was. Um, nice close-up of the bears. Then you got the monkeys sleeping. So this is, it was so hot. This is like 10 in the morning and it's already 90 degrees and 90% humidity. It's just ridiculous. Um, there we go. Nice little tiger shot there. Licking of the tongue there, looking at, oh, this is nice. So the um, the silverback, kind of cool, just hanging out, giving me a nice, good, straight-on stare. 
I so wanted to be able to get a slightly different angle. You see the hot spot behind? Like, that's, that's awful, right? I really wanted to get a different position so that I didn't have the hot spot behind him. But I couldn't because there was, you know, a tree there. I'm not allowed to go climbing fences for some strange reason. I don't know why they, they tend to frown on that sort of thing. But some decent photos. He just sat there and stared at me. Tried to get through the leaves, trying to get something a little bit more dramatic. It didn't really work that well. It was not that, it was not that great of a shot. Actually, you know what? I think this is probably would have been better if I'd stopped the lens down a bit and made the leaves a little bit more in focus so it looked a little bit more like I was spying through the leaves at the silverback staring back at me. Um, I should have done that, shouldn't I? Oh, well, I didn't. A little bit too shallow depth of field there. Ha, go figure. Okay, obviously I tried to get a lot of those. What was I thinking? I have no idea. That could have been one of those where I forgot the button was on full auto and went, oops, sorry. It may very well have been. So this is indoors. The chimps at this point, it was so hot that chimps are like absolutely not going outside. So this is indoors where it is very dark and they're behind very heavily tinted glass, one-way glass. So these photos are horrible, but I was trying to get something. And so... There's one shot in here that is kind of, there we go, that one's kind of cool. A little monkey hanging out there looking out going, oh, it'd be nice to go outside, but it's too hot. And clearly super high ISO. What are we at here? 25,600. At this point, I mean, it's the colors are totally shot. It's, again, we're shooting through really thick, heavily tinted, very dirty glass because on that side, you got the monkeys touching the glass. On this side, you got small human monkeys touching the glass. It's nasty situation, but I tried to get something. And I thought, you know, Maybe if I do this and I go like a black and white on here, maybe we can get something good. So I don't know. It's uh, I haven't really played with it much, but I think that in a pinch, you could get you can make that work all right. I mean, it's kind of you know very pensive, pensive thought there of the of our little chimp friend. Ninety-eight point something percent identical DNA to humans. It's remarkable. These things are crazy cool. They um, incidentally, while we were there. The first morning, where, yeah, the Saturday morning that we were there, they, uh, one of the chimps had a baby. And they called her Baby Jane after Jane Goodall. It was so cute, we didn't get to see the baby. But there are pictures, it's on their social media. It's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, then here, let's go into these. So very good close-up, very close close-ups. Um, giraffe's quite close to us. That is a giraffe eating watermelon. And this was kind of fun, just getting some extreme close-ups and not trying to show the whole animal. So it's kind of a, what animal is that? What strange creature is this here? That was kind of cool. But then, this is, gets fun. Okay, if you're afraid of snakes, just do this for the next few minutes because we're gonna look at some snake pictures. Um, there's this whole terrarium thing in the zoo and you can go up to the glass and see all the lizards and snakes and critters like that in there. Can't really use a tripod. Um, low light, relatively low light. It's a difficult situation to shoot in, right? And so I was trying to get some, and you know, there's a variety of different critters in there that, um, Am I looking through these pictures backwards? No. A variety of critters in here. That's actually not too bad. Um, that I was able to get some decent shots of. But there was this one snake that was so beautiful that I really wanted to get. Oops. Oh, that big lizard there. Here we go. This guy here. And I'm just, I'm looking at this going, oh, I've got to figure out how to get a good shot of this. So what I ended up doing, if you've ever, if you've never shot through glass before, I mean, I'll, if, you're, if your eyes are closed because of the snake, the snake is off the screen. You can open them again. Um, if you've ever shot through thick terrarium type glass like that. You know that you've got any light on the outside is gonna create reflections and you're shooting through reflections, that's horrible. So you put a polarizer on and that can help tremendously, uh, but not always, it's not always gonna get you all the way there. And so one of the things that you can do is if you put the lens right up to the glass, like imagine if you will, this tabletop was the glass, literally put the lens on it, not, not at it, kind of at an angle, but like seriously straight on it. You could do that even with the lens shade and that would give you some separation. But in this case, I just I was just straight on top of it. You could still have the challenge where if your window is double or triple paned, if you ever looked at or seen the reflection in a window and you see echoes of it, multiple reflections, is because it's multi-paned glass. That often happens in these terrarium type things. So you can still get a reflection from the backside of which you can do absolutely nothing about except move. But you just gotta find the right position. And so what I ended up doing here was holding the camera up against the glass. And I think, I actually did have a monopod. I was able to get a monopod in there and I'm adjusting the height of the monopod, trying to get it so that it's flat. I can keep the, the lens flat on the glass and obviously have the snake right in front of it. I mean, it doesn't do any good if the snake's up here and I want to shoot this way, then I can't have it flat on the glass. So I got to get it flat on. And I discovered it was really hard to know exactly it was in focus because the eye, okay, I'm going to go back to the picture of the snake. So cover if you're not a snake fan. Um, the eye has this 
kind of fogginess over it almost that was made it really, really hard to focus on. So I ended up using the scales around the eye as a focus point. You can see that drop of water right under the eye. And just, oh, I thought it was so beautiful. I just thought this was such a fun shot to get. And it took a while to get. And this one, let me see the info on this, ISO 800 at a fifth of a second. So I'm really, this was hard to get exactly right. But I shot a bunch of it and I did get it. I think I'm, I'm quite pleased with that picture. So that's pretty close focusing. I would say, what is the closest focus? Let's find out. Because I, I'm sure somebody wants to know this. I'm sure you could look this up too, but okay, it's at 200 millimeter right now. I'm not gonna hook up the things so you can see through. No manual focus. Let's set the focus to the closest distance. And let's just see what we're getting here. There we go. That's, that's in focus right there. So, so Ryan, there's a tape measure under somewhere. Grab it for me, please. Um, it's like a little bit more than my arm distance here from the front of the lens, obviously from the sensors a little bit farther away than that. But that's, that's pretty good. Uh, for a 200 mil lens, 400 mil equivalent to get that close, I think it's pretty special. And this was not fully zoomed in. Um, we know that because the aperture was f3.6, so if it had been zoomed in all the way, it would have been f4. So it zoomed out a little bit. Oh, it says right there was 100 millimeter. So, um, so yeah, not too bad. So if I go to 100 on here, let's see. <laughs> Ryan's crawling. And you can go behind, it's okay. It's very nice. He's trying very hard to not get into the shot. Uh, let's see here, if I go to 100, it's actually not that, oh, it's actually not that different. So there's 100. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Look, and a tape measure magically appeared. So let's see here. We are, from the sensor, we are 28 inches, give or take. From the front of the lens, we are 20 inches, give or take. And that was at 100. If I go to 200, it's really very, very little difference. Just slide it back just a little bit. So so that's cool. So you get a, a close focusing distance that's its closest, large, a large way through the focal range, the zoom range. Not too shabby. Oh, I like it. I was impressed. Anyway, okay, we're going to go back to the snake picture, so do that if you're not a snake person, snake fan. Um, but there, I just, I love that picture. I thought that was just beautiful. You zoom in there tight. Look at that thing. Oh, so pretty. Okay. All right, let's get past the snake. I will. I am. The snakes are gone. Anybody who wants to look can look again. Um, big lizard in there again, shooting through the glass, trying to get a good shot of these this Komodo dragon type of a thing. Um, through the glass, moving in and out of the sun, because this there actually was some sun coming in on this guy. Ooh, look at that, close up, dang. That is just like straight out of Game of Thrones, isn't it? So cool looking, ha, look at that, he loves it. Loves the camera, the camera loves you, darling. Uh, let's see what else we got in here. So, oh, I was trying to get some good action stuff of the ducks, but they were, or whatever, water fowl things, they were not that exciting. I was trying. But it was also, it was like 180 degrees outside. I eventually gave up on that. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm done trying to get a picture of these guys. But I tried. Eh, I wasn't too excited with anything I got there. You see, I, I shot a bunch of here before I just bailed because couldn't cope. Um, and then the penguins. The penguins are cool. Look at these penguin guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the penguins are fun. So this is them just kind of walking around in their penguin enclosure. No big deal. Still shooting through massive amounts of glass. Always the bummer. But then I decided I wanted to try and get a shot of the penguins flying up out of the water. So this is gonna be a fun example of not just the lens, but also shooting with the high frame rate on the G9. So the penguins, they have this pool area and you can kinda, of, is there a wide shot? I don't think I have a wide shot of it. Um, eh, kinda of here, you can kind of sort of see-ish there. It's kind of a wide-ish shot, not really. Nah, never mind. Anyway, they have this pool. Um, and they're doing, they're going back and forth and doing laps and they go, they swim under the surface of the water and they come up and they jump over the water, jump out of the water and dive back in. The thing is that it's really, well, first of all, they're moving incredibly fast. Second, it's really hard to see where they are underwater until they're just about to jump out or more likely after they've jumped out and they go back in and then you go, oh, that black blur, that was the penguin. How could I go back in time and see that? So I was taking advantage of the pre-burst setting on the G9. And the pre-burst setting, if you're not familiar with that, is when you put it into a high frame rate mode, um, high frame per second mode, pre-burst, when you push the button, it actually holds onto, it captures the last, I think it's, I forget now, five shots or something. I'd have to look it up this, uh, the exact numbers, but it, it captures back in time, essentially. The idea being you're watching 
a subject, you're waiting for a thing to happen. You see the thing happens and you push the button. Well, by that point, the thing has already happened. You push the button too late. This is why sports photography is so difficult. And those who are really good at sports photography know how to predict what's happening. They know the game well enough. They know what they're watching well enough to know that something's about to happen. It's time to start shooting. Well, pre-burst allows you to make that a little bit easier because when you see the thing happen, you push the button and it was actually already recording several shots before that and just constantly recording them and, and dumping them out of the buffer until you hit that shutter button and then it goes, ooh, we actually want to hold on to that last quarter of a second or whatever it was of shots and it pulls those in. So that's what I was relying on. And I'm, I mean, it's insane, right? I'm like this, trying to follow this penguin, good, crazy penguins jumping around all over the place. And I got a lot of bad shots, a lot of failed, but I did get a couple of shots that are kind of cool. So that's, that's the background story for what we're looking at here. Um, uh, people talking about the stream going bad. Looks good on this end. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's go in and take a look. So let me let me zoom out of this. Let's go to the grid view here, because um, I know oops, I know that there's some cool shots in here. I'm trying to get this little penguin flying around, and you can see. I mean, you can just see here. Let me just go through just to show you some, you know, not successful ones. Um, trying there is kind of coming up, and then at this point, you're you're trying to figure out where the penguin's going to be, trying to get focused on the penguin trying to move the camera towards the penguin. I can't, if I zoomed in too far, then I've got like no chance of getting the penguin. It's hard. It's really hard. You can kind of see almost it was like off to this corner there, so I didn't quite get it. But look how many frames per second it's shooting. That is kind of cool. That's pretty impressive. So here's another failed attempt. Let's get this up. So here was coming up out of the water. So you see at this point, we back up a few frames. So that'd be the first frame. There you could probably the first time that you actually saw the penguin, see that little shadow over here, like, oh, look, there's the penguin, and he's going to come flying up. So I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to get it. Not terrible, not terrible, but definitely not a winner shot. And, of course, <laughs> he goes right into the sunbeam and totally overexposes. Great, thanks, penguin. Appreciate that. Um, and that's what they look like under, just a black blur. But I know there, oops, I know there is a cool shot in here somewhere. Let's see if I can find it. Is that one of them? No, that one's out of, oh, there, there, we're getting there. These aren't terribly sharp. A little bit too much motion blur. Yeah, too much motion blur on those. Okay, so we'll keep going. And the fact that I was able to keep shooting like this, here we go. Here we go. Oh, I did start right that one. Look at the flying penguin midair. That's pretty. Let's go back up through these. So we'll see that from the beginning. So there we go. There's the first shot. So at this point, okay, you can imagine looking at this picture here. There's no way that I could have seen the penguin there and known to start shooting. So I didn't start shooting at this point. I probably push the shutter button right about there, and that's if I'm fast. Let's just call it there, and let's just consider the fact that I'm old and I probably didn't quite get it. So maybe this is when I started shooting, or maybe even here. And so the camera went, oh, okay, well, we're just gonna hold on to those last few frames on there starting right about there. Not too shabby, right? So, and then we get that penguin flying up out of the air, uh, out of the water into the air, and at some point we get something that's decent. It's still not great. It's just there's not enough light in there. It's really, really dark. Um, but, you know, it was, it was something. I guess, I, no, no, there we go. It was something. It was kind of fun. You see, look at these things. They're flying, like, way up in the air. This penguin is just cute. Fun little creatures. Anyway, so that's a fun thing of shooting with that. I, I stayed there for a while. I did have other work to do. I couldn't just spend my whole time hanging out there. But, uh, but uh, it's great. You know, I was able to get some decent stuff in there. I was able to get some decent stuff. Okay, so anyway, overall, 50 to 200 lens. Definitely two thumbs up on this one. I'm totally digging it. I'm hoping that I do get to keep this one because I, I don't know what I'll use it for on a regular basis, but it's good to know that when the time comes, you need a really long lens, it will be, it will be there for you. I know this would be a good one to take to India, um, especially when we're shooting with those massive crowds of people and I'm, there's going to be things all over the place. I'm going to want to get some stuff that's off in a distance, maybe get some shallow depth of field portraits at a little bit of a distance. This will be good for that. Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a great lens for that journey for sure. So I will I will definitely be wanting to take that one there. Yeah, overall, two thumbs up to the lens. I'm digging it. It's very, very sharp. You saw in some of the pictures where there weren't animals flying through the air. Uh, very, very sharp, great low light performance, uh, even on the G9 with the, the really high ISO on there. It's coming out great. I'm, I'm overall, overall digging it. Okay, we are uh, we're going to wrap it up right there. I'm going to jump into the Q&A. A few questions came flying by here. So if you have any questions about the lens, any of the particular photos we wanted to see, if you want any more details about it, just let me know in the comments and we will uh, we'll address that right now.